Have you ever been stuck in a growth phase that felt like it was going absolutely nowhere? Are you plateaued? Are you just stuck for some other reason? I think we've all probably been there at some point. So today we're gonna dig into what causes those phases in growth plateaus, what you can do about it, how you can bust through those and maybe avoid one in the first place, that and a whole lot more. This is episode 250 of The Drop Set. Let's hit it. Hey everybody, thank you for joining me. Darren Starr here, Five Star Physique. Been a full-time online contest prep and body transformation coach for coming on 15 years now. Welcome to The Drop Set, episode 250. Feels like a bit of a milestone. I feel like I should have something to uh, celebrate, like some champagne or like a cookie or something like that. Uh, unfortunately, I am in prep. I am 10 weeks and two days out, so there are no champagne glasses around here. There are no cookies around here. Actually, there are they're right over there, but I'm not touching them. I can't. They've been sitting there untouched for weeks, and there they will remain for weeks still. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, I'm 10 weeks out. So if you wanted to check out any details on how that prep is going, I will link over here uh, the playlist uh, or maybe just the latest video in that series, my 11-week out series. Those have been releasing on every Monday so far. I'm going to shift that to Tuesday just because my schedule has gotten a little wild and I can't. You know, I can't record, edit, and post the whole thing in a day. I got to break that into two days for sake of my own sanity. So um, those will be going up on Tuesdays going forward, but you can check those out if you're interested in seeing how things are going for me. Um, a little breaking news. I've been working on a course for some time here um, that I'm just about ready to launch at this point. Um, this is the Bikini Blueprint course, um, which is really a training-focused course for women um, either in bikini or wellness or anyone just chasing that kind of an aesthetic, even a non-competitor. It's a deep dive into appropriate training techniques. Um, there are three mesocycles built in that will give you um, a good solid progressive training program for at least six months. Uh, so it's a really good value there. And also there are sections built in where we do a deep dive on macronutrient nutrition, how to set it up, how to troubleshoot it, how to gauge your own progress and make changes to the plan on your own, and even an introduction to PEDs course for women built in there as well. So there's a ton of value in that. Um, it will be um, online at bikiniblueprint.com uh, in the next couple of days, probably. <laughs> so it's just about ready to go live. So um, I'm not doing pre-orders or anything like that. But if you are interested right now, you can email me. Um, I'll put my address on the screen for YouTube viewers. Hi, uh, Darren at Five Star Fitness. You can email me and I will put you on the list for updates as that gets closer and closer to release. Currently, I'm targeting June 1st to actually have the thing online and available for everybody. So really excited about that. It's been a lot of work and uh, all the um, effort that I've put into it so far, like I'm really, really happy with how it's turned out. So uh, more on that to come. For uh, for right now though, um, let's uh, let's dig in, shall we? We've got uh, this, uh, this episode to get through here. So we have a few topics here. Um, today is March 29th, 2024, episode 250. We're going to talk about setting yourself up for success, like building a routine um, or troubleshooting a routine, how you would build a routine that's something that's easy and repeatable while still being as close to optimal as it possibly can be. Um, this is something that a, a lot of people, I forgot to switch to the PowerPoint. There we go. <laughs> this is something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, I spent a lot of time in my uh, coaching life uh, helping people with this. <sighs> Realized I didn't turn my space heater off and my leg is burning over here. Um, I, I spent a lot of time helping people with this and uh, it, it's worthy of discussion here for sure. Um, next up, uh, I want to talk about what I would do today differently if I was starting bodybuilding out brand new. There's going to be some surprises in here. It's not all what you think. Um, it's not all like, I would learn how to squat from day one. No, I wouldn't, honestly. I wouldn't change that. I'm not a big squatter. I don't think that's what's holding me back. I would look at the things that hold me back in terms of physique, but also in terms of like mentally how I approach things. Uh, but what I want to start off with here is how to bust through these growth plateaus like I talked about in the intro here. So let's get to it here. Um, the first thing to assess is, are you actually at or in a plateau? Because you aren't necessarily. Um, 
First of all, are you consistent with how you're doing things? If you're not, maybe we fix that first. <laughs> because the thing is like growth seasons, growth phases for a lot of people, bulks, off season, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to use them all interchangeably. Um, they are, for a lot of people, the more relaxed phase. Like we're in prep, we're hardcore, we're on point every day. And then the show's over. It's like, oh, all right, off season. Cool. Let me relax a little bit. No, that's the mistake. You can't. You can't relax. If you want to improve between shows, this is when you really have to crush it. So what you do is you do your show, however it turns out, decompress, take a little time, take a week, take two weeks. Don't completely lose the plot and binge eat like crazy and set yourself up for a bad next phase, but relax. Take a couple weeks off from the gym, maybe get in one or two lifts, get a little cardio, be a little relaxed on the diet without being insane about it, but understand like, okay, that phase is over. The next day phase starts now and it needs to be attacked as aggressively as prep was. The people that make those strides between shows are the ones that attack their growth season just as if it were prep. So, um, and the lack of consistency is one of the big things there for sure. So, um, this is still going to require a reasonable level of data tracking. You've got to still look at photos. A lot of people, they, st they drop down to taking pics like every other week in the off season. I think that's a bad idea. Um, changes in uh, growth in muscle size are going to be harder to see. But you want to be able to also like correlate um, changes in the scale with the visual changes to see if you're getting a little too soft a little too quickly. You have to keep in mind also like some of that change in softness has to happen. That's a necessary part of it. It's unavoidable and it's okay. So it's not about beating yourself up, but it's really about like, huh, is this, am I being too sloppy here? Did I increase my macros too much? What's a good acceptable rate of growth per week? And if you're, if you're north of that, you can probably scale back a little bit. Um, does the data show that you're in a plateau or you just feel like it? Because you might say like, yeah, I don't see anything changing, but if you're gaining half a pound, three quarters of a pound per week, that's a good sign. You know, probably not all of that is muscle, but if you're working hard in the gym, some of it surely is. So that to me would not be a plateau. A lot of people go into this, they expect to gain two, three pounds a week, which is a great recipe to gain one and a half to two and a half pounds of fat a week because you can't build muscle that quickly. So you have to have reasonable expectations. You have to run the math and understand, you know, what should be happening and then kind of compare what you're observing with that. But it's not just the data, it's also the visuals as well. So um, let's assume right now that uh, you are consistent, you're working hard, and uh, weight just isn't moving, okay? First thing to assess is where are you on the spectrum of beginner towards advanced? And be really honest with yourself and understand that the higher up on this scale you are, the lower your expectations need to be as far as the rate of change. If you're a very advanced lifter, you've been bodybuilding for a long time, you're not going to gain very quickly. Like you're probably already close to your potential. You're looking for those little scraps that you can pick up here and there. If you're a beginner, you should be growing like a weed relatively. So um, a lot of beginners, they don't have um, uh, expectations that are quite high enough. And so if they're gaining, you know, a quarter of a pound every two weeks. I think that's good. I'm like, no, you can work harder than that. You can eat harder than that. We can increase faster than that. And if you're really a beginner, like your body will respond. So you want to be on the lower end of that spectrum. So evaluate yourself honestly. Like for me, I've been doing this for 25 years. Realistically, I would categorize my training as intermediate because I know that I can push a little bit harder. Like that's the area in bodybuilding where I struggle the most is like leaving reps on the table. I work hard and it feels sucky, but at the end of the day, like I know that if, if I'm going to pick up additional gains, that's going to be the area that I need to focus on. Cause after a set, I could be like, yeah, I could have, uh, I don't know if I had more reps in the table, but I could have fought harder on that last one, you know? So, um, I, I think, you know, advanced to me is kind of the tip of the mountain. Like once you get there, you've got really nothing to improve on. So I will probably always be intermediate. I'm judging myself a little harshly, but also I certainly don't consider myself advanced. Um, I consider myself advanced in knowledge. I know everything that I need to do. I just have a tough time really draining the battery 
on a lot of sets. Like I, I just will, will shortchange myself a rep here and there. Um, I will cut a rep short. Like I don't have a lot of that fight in me mentally where, you know, you're pushing for that rep. And as soon as you realize it's not going to happen, you just bail out. Whereas I see videos that a lot of clients send in where it's like very clearly you're not getting that rep, but they fight for it for like 10, 12, 15 seconds. They don't get it, but God, that's a lot of time under tension. Like that's a huge growth stimulus right there. Like that to me, if I'm looking for somebody who's really training hard, that's what I want to see. That's what I'm looking for. So um, training intensity, you need to be hypercritical of this stuff. This is our first consideration. So clearly if you're not growing, it's, it's one of a couple of things realistically. Um, and the first thing is you're not training hard enough. And this would be the most common one because a lot of people really overestimate their training intensity because they see like some, you know, 70 year old dude in the gym next to them. They're like, I train way harder than that guy. I'm like, yeah, well you better. And that's still not good enough. Probably like, you know, if <laughs> the, the, the people who fall into this trap here are the ones who are oftentimes the biggest guy in their gym or girl in their gym. You don't want to be the biggest guy or girl in your gym. You want to have somebody in there that's outperforming you to kind of set up a higher standard. Like I need to reach for that. So I've spent a lot of time in my life in gyms where I was the biggest guy in the gym on a given day. I'm not that big. It just tells you something about the gyms that I'm hanging out in. And it's one of the reasons why I don't go to the local Gold's gym in Farragut anymore. Um, because every day I walk in there, I'm pretty much the biggest guy in there. It's a geriatric gym. It serves its purpose. It's okay. It's dirty. I don't really care for that. Um, it's also way too bright, but most gyms are. Um, but I don't want to be the biggest guy in the gym. I want to have somebody in there that's outworking me so that I have a standard that I can elevate myself to. Then it's right there in front of me. Like shit. Okay. He or she is really bringing it. Like I got to match that. I got to surpass that. And it's when you start to get, vibes like that from a place that you know you're in the right place. Absolutely. So another thing would be a dietary sufficiency. Like if you, if you feel honestly, like I'm training really hard and you can be hypercritical of yourself and still come away with the conclusion that you're training really hard and you're not growing, you're simply not eating enough. Um, so it's, it's almost always going to be one of these two things. There are more considerations, but these are the top two, which is why spoiler alert, there are one and two on this list. So you probably need to eat more. Here's the thing. If you aren't gaining weight on the scale, you are not eating enough. That is a binary statement that has no exceptions at all. If you are not gaining weight on the scale, you are not eating enough. Now, if you are gaining weight on the scale, you may be gaining entirely body fat if your training intensity sucks or if you're just not going to the gym and you're just eating a ton of food. Sure, you can gain weight, but you need to be in a surplus in order to gain muscle at any kind of an appreciable rate at all. And in order for that to happen, you just have to eat more. Um, and this goes back to a conversation that I heard in the gym the other day. Um, these two guys behind me, because I never train with headphones on and I could hear every word they're saying. One guy says, man, I'm just not growing. And the other guy says, well, are you tracking your calories? And the other guy says, no, but I know I'm in a surplus. Wrong. You're not. If you're not growing, you're not seeing the scale go up. You are not in a surplus. That is the first law of thermodynamics in action right there. It is that simple. If, you, if the scale is not going up, fucking eat more. It is that simple. Um, now, it's not just that. We need to make sure that you're training hard. There are other considerations, but just on a very basic level, if the scale is not going up, you are not eating enough eat more. Uh, eat more what? Well, without digging into the details on, on diet and macros, because it's not really about that, make sure your protein is sufficient, minimum one gram per pound of body weight. And then beyond that, uh, there isn't a whole lot of value increasing beyond like 1.2, maybe 1.4 grams at an upper limit. There's some research that suggests that 1.6 is Eh, I don't find that terribly compelling. I think that's a lot. And also in a growth phase, you you will if you if this is you, if this situation describes you in a growth phase, you need to eat more. More protein isn't the answer because that's going to fill you up and eventually you're just not going to be able to eat more. So more carbs, more fats, it doesn't matter. Like whatever sounds appealing. You know, you could follow the Sam Sulek method and just go go eat Subway and and bullshit all day, you know, whatever. Um, you just need more calories, but be consistent with it and track it so that you know how many calories you're taking in and you can correlate that with a change or lack of change in the scale and then plan accordingly. So that's the, the those are the two big things, training intensity and dietary sufficiency or insufficiency. Uh, if you correct both of those, you are probably going to bust through your plateau, but there are other considerations as well. Your total training volume. Um, so it could be that your training intensity is really high, but it's a stimulus that your body's accustomed to. 
and you have to remember at all times, your body would really just kind of rather not have to build more muscle. That's hard work. So there's all these barriers in place to kind of prevent your body from having to do that work. You have to eat enough. You have to have enough protein. You have to be training hard enough. There's other considerations as well. And so, yeah, it would just rather not. And so sometimes you can train really hard, but maybe you just need to train more. This isn't the case for a lot of people. I think more people will tend to overtrain rather than undertrain. So look at your total volume and figure that you want to be in a range where per muscle group you're hitting 12 to 16 high quality working sets per week per muscle group. If you're in that range, you're probably good. Now, in accordance with the next one, however, which is your rest, recovery, and stress management, um, if you are not having any issues with recovery at all, um, you're very well rested. Your stress is managed. Um, your body always feels like it's ready to go. You're eating plenty. Your training intensity is hard, but it's like you, never, you just feel like you never need a day off. I'm going to question that a little bit and still always take one. Um, but at that point, a little increase in volume would help. So I'm not saying if you go from 12 to 16 sets and you feel recovered there, let's go to 20 to 24 sets. No, like add one set per workout per, per uh, one set per day for a week and see how that feels. One working set is a pretty good size increase in volume. So if you're hitting 15 working sets, do 16. And I would add that one working set to whatever exercise feels like it's the most productive. Um, the one that you feel the most connected with, that you have the greatest proprioception with, that just feels super dialed in and you're like, fuck yes, I could do this all day. Okay, well don't do it all day, but do an extra set of it. You know, Find, find that one exercise, ride the hot hand. It's like if some guy on the basketball court keeps draining threes, keep feeding him the ball. You know, if, if this particular exercise just feels super connected, hit it again, give it another set. Regarding rest, recovery, stress management. So um, recovery is more about like your, your ability to feel like you're ready to train each day. So this is going to involve things like stretching, additional um, external things like massage work, you know, if you uh, injury prevention, rehab, dry needling, cupping, things like that. Um, I would include like massage gun work in this as well. Um, plain old static stretching also. Um, those kind of things. Um, you know, taking a, uh, you know, a Epsom salt soak, stuff like that. Um, rest days would be more like days off and sleep. Um, there's a lot of crossover between rest and recovery, which is why they're often conflated. The other thing is, you know, uh, you always hear people say like, you know, make sure your body's recovered, make sure you're good to go. But nobody ever really defines what that means. Um, how I define that is whatever muscle group you're ready to train feels ready to work. Once you start working, it feels like it's performing well. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily factor soreness into that too much. But also like mentally, you're excited to get to the gym. If any of those things are lacking, you're probably under-recovered and could benefit from a, some additional time out. So recovery can be some active things that you do, but it's also the state of just being recovered. And if you're not recovered, you probably need additional rest. Um, stress management factors into all this as well. You just need to uh, make sure that you know, whatever stress factors are influencing your cortisol and your overall just brain overload, that you're addressing those head on, whether it's family, work, finances, whatever, like have a plan of attack in place to resolve whatever the issue is and then allow yourself to compartmentalize that, shut it out of your brain, throw away the key when you're in the gym and put in some work. Um, so the, the recovery thing is really big because it's more about like feeling, man, am I ready? Am I feeling this? Do I feel ready? And if I do, if I get in there and I start, am I feeling like it's working? I'll give you an example. Monday, I went in for quads. Um, and I was working with my trainer, Sam, and she was, <laughs> I mean, it didn't take a lot of, a lot of sussing out from her. She was like, what's off today? I'm like, dude, I don't know. Like, I just, I am not with it today. Like my, my quad was kind of hurting a little bit. Like there was, it felt like there was a knot in it or something like that. Um, but there was no bruise or anything, but it just felt weak. Um, my knee was a little off. Um, just my output was super low. And I told her, I'm like, yeah, I think, you know, if it feels like this next Monday, I think we'll skip quads for a week and lay off of them and do something else on Monday instead. Um, or maybe delay it till later in the week. I don't know. Um, but uh, it was brutal. It sucked. And that's how I'm like, okay, I am under recovered right now. 
So then the plan goes in place, like, you know, reach out to Mama Jojo, my, uh, my massage therapist. Um, I, I haven't gotten in to see her yet, but I'm trying. Um, spend some more time with a massage gun, do a little bit more stretch work, um, not just for the quad, but also the glute. So I think some of this knee pain is coming from glute tightness. So this is an example of me being under-recovered. I'm not in a growth phase, but recovery things are pretty universal regardless of what phase you're in. So... Um, I would make sure that you're hitting all four of those points, that your training intensity is there, your dietary, um, uh, your caloric intake is up to snuff. Your total volume is, first of all, not too high, but if it's moderate, maybe increase it slowly and make sure that you're properly rested and recovered. So what are some actionable things that we can do here? So first thing would be, you know, consider a significant shakeup to your training. Like if you're just going to the gym and showing up and doing shit, without a plan, get a plan in place. That's a pretty significant shakeup to the structure, and it's a necessary one also. Unless you're a genetic freak, you're not going to show up to the gym, do random shit every day, and see progress. It's just not going to happen. That's what everybody does. That That is the workout program of the people who look the same for years on end. So do not be that person. Again, if you're a genetic freak, exceptions are made. Um, but if you've made it this far into this segment here, chances are you're probably not a genetic freak. I'm sorry to break it to you, but it's probably not you. It's not me either. So um, you have to have some structure in there. Now you might need to modify the structure, like look at how things are, are put together, how things are built for your workouts and shake some things up, change some exercise order. Maybe if you're pairing certain muscle groups on the same days, separate those out a little bit. Um, if your volume is really high, drop it down. If your volume is really low, increase it. Um, if you're not tracking your workouts, do that. That should be an essential thing at all times anyway. Next actionable item, eat more. This is an easy one. You know, it's just, just eat more. You know, think about like, uh, you know, if, if things aren't growing, um, take your caloric intake and just increase it by 10% for a week. Watch your numbers, see if anything moves. If it doesn't increase another 10%. If it does cool, let it ride for a little bit. And I, I would just bump it up in 10% increments. So if you're eating 1500 calories a day, bump it up to 1650. That's a 10% jump. If you're eating 2,500 calories per day, 2750. There you go. So just a 10% jump. Um, you don't need to go from like, Oh, I'm eating 2,500. Let me do 3,500 like that. I mean, you'll probably see the scale move, but you're just going to be putting on more fat at that point. So a smaller increase always makes more sense. Um, do some volume calculations. And figure out like how much you're actually putting into a specific muscle group. And by calculations, I don't, I don't mean like, you know, sit down with the abacus or the slide rule and figure shit out, but just tally it up on your fingers. Like, what's the total volume for my back day? Okay, cool. Um, is there anything else that I'm doing that feels like it's engaging the back? You know, like, man, when I do those RDLs, they're really heavy and it feels like I'm, I'm really getting a lot of lat and trap engagement there too. Okay, well, you know, it's not a set for back, but maybe we count every set of RDLs as like a half, you know? So think about that. And you may find that certain muscle groups, like you might find that biceps, for example, are getting enough volume without even directly training them. Just with back work and, you know, they're, they're held with a, a static con, con, uh, static tension um, when you're doing flies for chest, et cetera. So uh, they might not need a whole lot of work, you know? So consider that. And also like consider your strengths and think about pulling back on volume from those areas that are strong, maybe even not training them at all, um, and putting that volume somewhere else. Because each muscle group can handle a certain amount of volume, but your body can only handle a certain amount of volume a week as well. And so if you're wasting that on areas that are already strong, you can't put it towards something else. So a lot of things to potentially consider there. Here's the big one for the growth phase, and that is remain focused and proceed with a sense of urgency. This is one of the biggest things that I see people do is they're just casual in their off season. They're like, yeah, it's not prep, kind of like we talked about at the start. It's not prep. I'm just going to be a little bit more relaxed. You can't do that if you want this to be an effective phase. And again, if you've made it this far into this segment, chances are you want this to be an effective phase. So you need to have a sense of urgency. Like this growth phase is only so many weeks long. I've only got this many weeks left. Like we got to go. You know, I've only got seven back workouts left in this phase. We got to go. Rather than like, I've got two months left. You've got seven back days and that's it. How are you going to make it grow? Get on it. Sense of urgency. Um, and then recover really well. That's the other big thing is you need to manage your time, 
your organization. These are all things that you do to reduce your stress. If your stress is lower, your recovery is going to be better. Take your days off, sleep really well, and do the little things in between workouts, especially if you have any areas that are problem areas, like my shoulder, for example, is problematic. So I do rehab for that with bands every day as part of my warm up. My quad is now an issue and my knee, so I need to do a little bit more work for that, which is going to include standing up and stretching out after I finish this segment and before the second one. So um, I practice what I preach. I try to anyway. Um, getting some massage work done, spending some time with a massage gun, that kind of stuff. So um, growth phases, they're, uh, they're, a pain. they're difficult because it's just easy to approach them just a little bit too relaxed. So the main thing is be consistent, be aggressive with your approach to it. Um, also, not mentioned here, but um, another thing that you could consider, especially if, if, your, if your gym performance feels stagnant, um, would be if you are on PEDs, an escalation there can be helpful too. So that, the, that would be the time to escalate is during a growth phase. Um, during a uh, cut, you don't need nearly as much, but to get the body to grow, you might need to escalate a little bit there as well. So just another consideration. Quick time out here and thanks again for watching. So podcasting is fun for me, but coaching is how I actually make a living. <laughs> Being an online coach has been my exclusive full-time gig for coming up on 15 years now. Hard to believe that. If you're looking for a coach, either for competition prep or just to get in the best shape of your life, you can check out 5starphysique.com and click on coaching for details on the programs that I offer. Quick version here. I get a ton of information up front to create a starting plan, and then we check in weekly to adjust that as we go based on your specific goal and the timeline involved. There's loads of detail up on the website, so I'll keep this short. Just check out 5starphysique.com for details. The link is in the description below. I do take on a limited number of clients and want to have a little bit of back and forth before starting up just to make sure that we're a good fit. So check out the website, read up, and hit the contact button to reach out to me directly. Okay, back to it. All right, welcome back. Thank you for uh, sticking with me here. So, um, if you uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, if you want to give me a little thumbs up and a, uh, I was gonna say a like, but that is a thumbs up. Like the video. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. If you want to leave a comment about anything that you have questions or comments on in here, or to suggest any th segments for uh, future episodes, please do. If you're listening online, um, audio only, and you have the ability on your platform to leave a rating or review, please do so, and I would greatly appreciate it. It helps me out literally more than anything else. Um, the more ratings this podcast has, the more it shows up for people who just generally search for podcasts or bodybuilding related stuff in general. So um, let's get on with it here. Building the perfect daily routine. What does this look like? I consider myself a master of the routine. So this is going to be a challenge to see if I can get you on board um, and get you up to my level. There aren't too many things where I think like I'm on like master level, but routine is one of them. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty humble on most things and pretty self-deprecating on most things. Um, but when it comes to routine, like, no, I got this shit. I know what I'm doing here. So <laughs> Uh, I'm very, very confident in my ability to develop a routine, adjust it as needed, and stick with it. So um, what does this look like? What makes for, hello mouse, come on, what's going on here? There we go. What makes for a good routine? The first thing is it has to be easy. If it's not easy, you are going to fail. <laughs> like, uh, it, it, like with anything in life, the easier something is, the more likely it is you're going to stick with it. It has to be built for sustainability as well, which is, it kind of goes hand in hand with ease, but something can be easy and not sustainable if it, you know, because something can be easy or simple, but still kind of complex and require a lot of work. I'm looking for something that's easy, that has a lot of background elements to it, like things that uh, just don't require a lot of intervention or extra time. So um, it should be appealing and fun. Um, you know, remember, like, bodybuilding shouldn't feel like a second job. I mean, it is, realistically, but it sh should feel like the job that you feel lucky that you get to have, right? That's what we're trying to do here. So it's certainly, it's hard to say that and with a straight face because it does require sacrifice. It requires saying no to a lot of things, and it, it requires doing things that are just uncommon among the general population. A lot of people think, why do you do that? Why are you weird like this? And you're like, I just am. Chill out. Stop judging me. Why aren't you like this? That's the question. So it should be appealing and it should be fun. And it should leave you time for other stuff as well. So uh, promotional bit here for me. I just released uh, at the time this is dropping on Friday. So two days ago, I just released a new single out. So if you search for my name, Darren Starr, on Spotify or iTunes or whatever, you'll find that I have a new song that I put out called Amputate Regenerate. Sounds dramatic. It is. Um 
It's nine and a half minutes long. So for all you fans of 10-minute prog rock instrumentals out there, all negative four of you probably, um, then it's right up your alley. <laughs> so if you want to check it out, please do. Why am I bringing this up? Um, I recorded that entirely at home over the process, over the course of several months. I wrote the damn thing. I tracked everything in it, which is piano, uh, bass. I program the drums note by note for hand. There's 10 rhythm guitar tracks and about 14 solo guitar tracks, some other keyboards, strings, etc. There's a lot of stuff in there. It was a lot of time spent tracking that. I mixed the entire thing top to bottom, realized that it kind of sucked, undid a lot of that, redid it, and then I mastered the thing at home and um, did cover art for it, did a photo shoot here, set that all up, edited a promotional video for it, did all that. I did all that while I was in prep. So um, a good routine and, and like managing a full-time client load and running a business and building courses as well. Now, that's why it took months instead of like maybe three or four weeks. If I, you know, realistically, if I was a full-time music producer, I probably could have done that whole track start to finish in two weeks. Um, it's still a lot of work. It's a 10-minute song. It's very complex. There's a lot of stuff going on in it. Um, so it would have taken a couple of weeks realistically, even if it was full-time. Um, so the fact that it took four months is because I was in prep. I was doing another full-time job. I was trying to grow that job into other avenues as well. But there was still time for it. That's the big thing. So a good routine is going to leave you time for that. So there are two main components of your bodybuilding routine. There's the input routine and there's the output routine. So the input routine consists of things like how many meals do you eat per day? What's the timing of those meals? The composition of those meals? How much variation uh, or sameness are there in those meals? What's your water intake? Can you remember to take your supplements on a daily basis? Those are all things on the input side of the equation. The output routine is a little simpler. When and how frequently are you going to train? When and how frequently are you going to hit cardio? What are your rest days? So, um, that's kind of like negative output a rest day, but either way. So you've got to think like, basically it comes to diet and then training slash cardio, finding ways to fit in all this stuff and get things to mesh nicely with each other. So, um, what you need to do is consider your immovable life points, the fixed beacons that you have to work around the obstacles in your daily routine that cannot be moved. So this might be something like, you know, if, uh, this is typically a job for most people, like, I work from nine to five. Cool. So therefore you can't train at 10 a.m., which might be nice because maybe the gym isn't super crowded at 10 a.m. Not an option. Okay. We work around that. This could also be family. Um, it could be a lot of other things. They know they're, you know, especially if you have kids, um, a lot of things revolve around their school, extracurricular activities, stuff like that. So you've got to kind of f factor in those immovable points, those obstacles that you just can't push aside or anything like that. I would strongly recommend um, putting all that stuff on your calendar, which might seem kind of dumb to put your nine to five day job on your calendar, but block that off and visually you will know that is time when you can't do anything else and everything else that you want to do falls around that. I would go so far as to add sleep onto your calendar as well. And then you can see like, okay, now it, you know, let's pretend that all these items show up in your calendar is red. Everything that's red is blocked off. Everything that's not red is free. Let's start filling it up. So um, figure out when you're going to do your training and your cardio first. Um, and then we base other things around that. So the big thing here is when are you going to train? Now, there's two factors here. When can you and when do you want to? Um, and I would always start with when do you want to and then see if that's even a feasible option. A lot of people are like, I love training in the morning. Cool. Okay, how can we make this work and be efficient with it? So efficiency really matters. If you train in the morning, you're going to a gym. Um, are you going to go straight from the gym, get ready for work there in the locker room and then go straight to work? Are you going to come back home first, which is probably more time spent? So then your whole routine needs to be adjusted. You need to take all of your getting ready for work supplies to the gym with you. So which, you know, I've, I've done all of these things in the past. Like I've, I've had... <coughs> 
I've had that situation where you go to the gym, um, like I go there at four in the morning and I'm done by 5.30, I take a shower, I'm on the road by 5.45, um, I'm going to my job, uh, which is 45 minutes away, I'm there at 6.30, I work for a few hours and then I have class to go to. Okay, I hop on my bike, which was strapped onto the back of my car when I made that drive, and then I, I ride my bike onto campus, I do my classes there, I come back for a little bit more time at the job after that, and then I drive back. So, you know, I've done all this stuff. <clears throat> Point being, everything is workable. You just have to figure out how efficient you need to be with things. Where are you taking an extra 10, 15 minutes? Like one thing that I could have done in that routine that would have been a negative would have been to go to the gym, do all my stuff there, come back home, get ready, and then go off to work from there. That adds an extra 10 minutes of travel, which doesn't sound like much, but when you're busy, 10 minutes means a lot. It means a lot. So think about where you can shave off five minutes here, 10 minutes there, et cetera. Um, when are you going to train? When are you going to do cardio? Um, uh, and it's assuming you need to. But if you don't, I would plan for it anyway because at some point you will probably need to. And you got to think about like where is that going to fit? I wouldn't just say, ah, we'll worry about that later. Like, worry about it now while you're doing all the planning for this. And consider if you don't have to do it, great. That's time that you just gained back. That's a bonus. We like that. So, um, the other thing to consider here, so that's when you want to train, but when can you? Uh, when is it more ideal? And think about this. I hear this a lot from clients where uh, this this happens a lot. And uh, it's, well, I was going to train after work, but I was just too tired. You know, after the work day, I was just zonked and I couldn't do it. I say, okay, great. So that doesn't work. Let's do it before. Like, ah, I don't really want to. Well, it's not about when you want to, it's when is it going to work for you? And if you do it long enough, you can learn to like it. And you just have to accept like, this is what I have to do. And so let me learn to like it and learn to live with it. Um, that's, that's a much better approach than just continuing to ram your head against the wall and miss workouts because you're too tired or, you know, very common, like I'm going to do cardio after work. Are you? And there's been a lot of evidence that I've seen where no, people don't. <laughs> Sometimes they do, but oftentimes they don't. So once you've got those blocks in place, we can plan and schedule your meals around that. So building the dietary routine here, decide on the best number of meals. I would recommend four at an absolute minimum. I think five is the sweet spot. Six is just kind of a pain in the ass for most people. I don't do six, I do five. Um, and you know, we, we won't get into like how we do the macros for all those. This is just assuming. Um, we've got the, the number of meals set in place. We can figure out the macros from there. If not, I would strongly recommend you listen to episode 177 of the drop set, Blast from the Past here, um, which is macros from the ground up, which is not available on YouTube. You will have to go to an audio-only podcast source for that, but episode 177 uh, is, uh, is your source there. Now, if I think about it, I will put a card up here in the corner on YouTube where you can go and listen to that from my website where I have all the episodes archived as well. So, um, so think about your pre-workout meal timing, your post-workout meal timing. So, you know, pre, obviously we know when we're going to have these, um, before and after the lift as the name might suggest. So your pre-workout meal should be somewhere between 30 and 90 minutes prior to lifting based on the composition. So if you are somebody who has to be like, I got to wake up and immediately get out the door and go to the gym. You need a really fast pre-workout meal and something like a protein shake that has carb in it. It's going to have very fast gastric emptying. It's not super satisfying, but it's about utility more than anything else. Don't train fasted. Training fasted is not an option. It's not something that successful lifters do with any kind of consistency. Um, your post-workout meal timing, you can have that immediately after you train. I would recommend waiting a little bit, at least 20, 25 minutes just to let your your parasympathetic system kind of chill out a little bit um, and you'll have better nutrient absorption if you just wait a little bit and you can wait up to an hour, hour 15 after, uh, after you lift and, uh, and still get the maximum benefit from that. Space everything else out as needed and don't overthink the timing of stuff. It doesn't really matter all that much. Think about the ranges how much space you have between meals and try and even those things out a little bit. Try to avoid having consecutive meals at the same time. That If you can do that, you're 90, 95% of the way there. The other 5%, honestly, for most people is not worth it. You're not going to get much benefit from micromanaging your meal timing to the point where it's like, 
clockwork like precision every single day. We really just don't need to necessarily do that. So um, think about also just as far as meal composition is concerned, um, convenience. So like if meal three, if you're always eating that in the car, consider making that something portable. Um, so this goes back to like constructing a diet that is going to help fit with your routine where, you know, if you're in the car, maybe eating chicken and rice isn't the easiest. I know a lot of people do that. I don't think it's particularly safe or a great idea to eat in the car with a fork, but whatever. Um, but something that's a little bit more portable might be a really good fit. So additional considerations. Um, don't forget to drink water. <laughs> so uh, I do always recommend heavily loading that during your training. I'd take in you know, 30 to 60 ounces of water during your training session. Um, keep your water bottle, jug, whatever you have nearby when you're either at work or you're just kind of not doing stuff. You know, Just keep it there so it's visually within range and you can always see it and be like, oh yeah, I should drink some of that. Set uh, timers on your phone if you need to, um, whatever it takes. Uh, water is one of those things that people just commonly struggle with. It's the most basic thing. It's the one thing that we absolutely need to survive. And yet it's very easy to not get enough of it. Understanding that as bodybuilders, we benefit from a little bit more of it than the average person does. So when are you best going to remember to take your supplements? Um, so I, I had this issue myself for a long time. Uh, and so I started the habit of taking my little pill container and dumping it on my desk first thing in the morning. Just flip it down. Because um, the first thing I do is I'm going to uh, start doing cardio. So I will take like my Yohimbean. If I have a caffeine supplement, like I'll take those like immediately. The rest of them, like I don't want all that stuff sloshing around my stomach while I'm pedaling away on the bike. I'll come back for that later. I would often forget. So if I dump them on my desk, it drives me nuts. I'm OCD. I don't like having a bunch of crap on my desk. I know I'm going to take those throughout the day. Even if it takes a while, I know I'm going to get them in. So there have been times where I didn't get them in until the evening, but I still got them in. I don't forget them at that point. So um, that's uh, that's uh, the tactic that I have found. Like Make them in your way. <laughs> if you make them in your way, it's harder to forget it. Um, this also goes to um, a lot of people will like pack their food the night before for when they leave for work the next day and then forget it. Like they leave it in the fridge. First of all, it's pretty easy to not do that. But all, uh, the thing that I have done before, um, because when I was in my 20s, I did that once. So what did I start doing? I put my keys in my meal bag, which was still in the fridge. Um, and so therefore, I couldn't leave without my meal bag. Problem solved. How much dietary variation do you need? This is the final point here. So uh, some people, they're like, I can't eat the same thing every day. To which I say, mm, you probably can. Maybe you're just not eating the right stuff. Um, the thought that you can't eat the same thing day after day, like, of course you can. Just make decisions and, and uh, select meals and build meals that are a little bit more appealing. Um, but also, like, is that necessary? It's not necessary. I do find that um, when you have the same plan in place, you can spend a lot less time thinking about this. A plan that is simple and repeatable and the same every day is just easier to follow. It's a simple fact. And if we're struggling with routine to the point where you've made it this deep into this segment and you're still listening to it, you're probably struggling with routine, at least on some level. Simplify. Simplify your diet. Make it the same every day. Or um, a couple of my clients, um, they have a macro plan that they follow, and they built themselves three meal plans, an A, a B, and a C plan that all hit those numbers. And so um, what they do is they just, I mean, I'm not sure how they do it, if they just, you know, pull a, a letter out of a hat each morning to see what plan they're following or what. But they have three plans, so there's variety built into that, but they're all set around the same set of macro numbers. So when I change their macros, they now have three plans to adjust as opposed to just one, but they get variety that way. And still, like, probably on some of those plans, there's still certainly some similarity between some meals, but there's some differences as well. But all those differences have been worked out in the math, and so you're not going to have any issues with precision or accuracy in hitting your numbers over the long term. Hey everybody, I hope you're enjoying this episode. Just wanted to take a quick time out to tell you about a promotion I have going on now for my workout programs at 5starphysique.com. I have around 50 uh, programs available as of right now. These are comprehensive workout splits for all people, goals, and phases. You can search by volume, general difficulty level, even the number of supersets involved so you don't end up with something that you can't properly execute because your gym is just too damn busy when you go to train. All of these programs do include full video demonstration playlists for each day narrated by yours truly so you know exactly what to focus on and what to watch out for on every move. These are ideal for all skill levels. You can use the promo code DROPSET 
one word at checkout to save 10 bucks on your first program. Link is in the description below or check out fivestarphysique.com and click on workout programs. Okay. Let's get back to it. Okay, and finally today, how I would start over. If I was going to at the ripe old age of 47, or I don't know, if I'm starting over, can I get in a time machine and do this when I'm younger? Like, can I go back to 25 and start over? How I would with regards to bodybuilding if I was going to start over from uh, from the beginning. So, first of all, allow me to intro introduce myself. I am, in fact, as a slide will point out here, a used car salesman. Um, so... Uh, the obvious thing is I'm going to hire a coach first thing. Now, um, the reason I make that recommendation is because of my experience being a coach, but also having had many coaches over the years, but not when I first started out. Um, hire a coach. It, it is seriously, if you get a good one, um, it is the biggest investment you can make. Well, the, I mean, maybe the biggest. It's the best investment you can make. Um, your coach shouldn't cost 500 bucks a month. Um, I've seen plenty of coaches who charge that. And honestly, like whatever results they bring you, you can get for a better price than that if you just shop around. Um, I won't turn this into a commercial for me, but I'm cheaper than that. So <laughs> uh, uh, seriously, though, when I first started out, I did not have a coach for years. Um, my first coach, we're going to get into some name dropping here. Um, I've referenced this guy before. I won't get into all the details, but the very first coach I ever had was Tad Inouye. Um, Tad, the diet coach, he was branded. And he was one of these guys where he'd send you his plan in an Excel spreadsheet, which is where I got the idea to use Excel for diets, by the way. Um, he put everything, he put his training in there, which, yeah, I, I've, I don't do that. Um, but an Excel spreadsheet that had like pictures of him in it. <laughs> I'm like, all that does is increase the file size and make this file more cumbersome to send via email. Like, don't do, leave your photo out of it, dude. Um, kind of funny. Um, so I don't do that. I don't put my pictures uh, in my plans, <laughs> nor, nor have I ever, nor will I ever. Um, but uh, he was the first guy I ever hired as a coach. And uh, it wasn't, wasn't a brilliant experience, but I was also young and didn't really know any better. I wasn't that young. Um, but... I was young, I was old enough. I should have known better. Um, not not the greatest. Um, definitely, like I think this is true for a lot of coaches. Um, more invested in clients that they feel are going to be more successful, um, which is, you know, I definitely felt like I was getting that treatment. And so, from a very early age in my bodybuilding journey, that kind of instilled upon me that I never want to be that guy. Like I don't care who you are. I don't care what your goal is. Like. It, you always get the serious treatment from me. So, um, but hiring a coach, like before Tad, what did I do? Well, I read stuff on the bodybuilding.com forums. I read magazines and I talked with, uh, Travis who was maybe, you know, not really a coach, but he wrote a couple of plans for me. Travis was a bodybuilder in the gym and when I tell you, like, he was a bro, like, he was a bro. Like, he is the ultimate in bro science. Like, man, thinking back now, I'm like, ah, oh, I got some terrible advice from him. Um, and I mean, like, to, to the point where it's like he had, he had pretty significant health issues because of uh, PED abuse. So, um, not the kind of guy that you want to be taking advice from. So, uh, but get a coach. Absolutely. And then listen to this coach as well. You can't just hire a coach and then do your own thing. You've got to do what they tell you to do, but it has to be somebody who you know is good and is qualified. So get references, um, listen to reputations, follow them online, see what kind of results they bring. See if it looks like, you know, more than anything else, um, because a lot of coaches, like uh, a lot of the, the results that they're able to deliver kind of depends on the clients that they're working with to some extent. It certainly can. Um, but I would, I would like listen to the stuff that they put out online, um, things related to diet, things related to training. Are they saying things that make sense? Um, are they avoiding fad stuff? Are they saying like, well, all you need to do is work harder? Like, that's great. How do I do that? You know, are they, are they going to be able to help you advance? Because there's a lot more, you know, what I would say is you want a coach, not a plan writer. A guy like Shelby Starnes is a plan writer. He is not going to coach you through shit. He's not going to teach you anything. He is going to write a plan. He is going to expect you to follow it. And it's up to you to be able to improve from there. So um, you want a coach, 
not a plan writer if you're starting from scratch. Um, so, um, Captain Obvious reporting for duty. What else? So, learn everything that you can. Um, we are at a point now in the year 2024 where the sum total of all human knowledge is a search box away. Um, you just kind of have to know what the right sources are. So, a couple of uh, the ones that I would recommend, like... YouTube is just a fantastic resource for bodybuilding stuff because there's so much um, bodybuilding content that goes up on YouTube every single day. So aside from just this channel, which of course you should be subscribed to if you're watching this there, thank you very much. And if you're listening, go subscribe to my YouTube channel too. You'll like it, I promise. Um, Renaissance Periodization, Mike Israetel, big fan of him. Um, little, uh, you got to be okay with some inappropriate humor, which I think most people are. Um, if you're not, Jeff Nippert is the next guy for you who is, uh, by all accounts on his YouTube channel, possibly the most boring human being I've ever seen. Um, but he has great information. Um, I, I don't detect a personality, but he has great information that's very solid, and I agree with most of the things that he says. Not all, but most. Um, but immerse yourself in the world. So if you're looking to compete um, go to shows, <laughs> like, like understand how it works, read about it, follow the pros. Um, you know, I wouldn't say develop role models, but find people who, whose work ethic and results you admire and kind of dig in on what they're doing. Um, you know, try and learn from them. Um, you know, a guy like Chris Bumstead is a good example because he, he sets a great example of how to conduct yourself, how to, how to work hard, how to be consistent. Um, and I think if the, the more you, you surround yourself with that kind of energy, the easier it is to leech off of it, emulate it and kind of put a spin on it and make it your own. Um, here, here is one thing that I would say is, is a little out there, but it's, it's definitely something that I would do, which is don't make it weird. Um, normalize it. So here is the thing. Bodybuilding is kind of weird, right? You're doing all this shit just to look better. I mean, you know, with our society today, that shouldn't be weird because, you know, with the amount of cosmetic surgery procedures available, um, you know, with how, um, how, how much money like the dieting industry makes on a year to year basis, like how much the supplement industry makes from non bodybuilders, the popularity of a guy like Dr. Oz who sells bullshit fat loss things on his show all the time. Like, it clearly like it's okay to be vain and narcissistic and want to look better. Right. So, um, bodybuilding is just the next logical extension of that. Don't make it weird. What I have done in my head from the very beginning is made it weird and made it seem like it's something that's not normal. And therefore I've never really embraced it and owned it the way that I would like to. And that's coming from a guy who, again, let's full stop here and understand this has made a career out of bodybuilding. That's no small feat, um, but I still view it as weird and something that I really shouldn't be proud of. Like, oh, yeah, I do that. Yeah, let's talk about something else. Um, so I'm working to change that myself, but it's hard because that's been ingrained in my head for like 25, 30 years now. Um, so I still view it as being weird. And if you can normalize it, you allow yourself to take ownership of it and you allow yourself to kind of embrace it. I'm not saying it has to become your personality, um, but you need to be okay with it becoming a part of your personality. Um, because when you do that, you'll find yourself less likely to hold back. And I think there's tremendous power from that. I think there are tremendous results that can be tapped from that, just from owning that, um, and embracing it. And just being like, yeah, it's weird. Who cares? I'm weird, I guess. That's fine. You don't like it? Fuck you. I don't care. Like, there's power in that. Like, take it. Claim it. Make it your own. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a very valuable thing. And if I could go and change one big thing, it would be that. The second one would be this, which is to meet people. Um, now, this is the area. So uh, if there was one area that I suck at, this would be it. Because I don't like meeting people. Um, but I also find that, you know, being successful in the industry, um, and, uh, having more fun and enjoyment in the industry, a lot of it revolves around meeting people. And so I know a shockingly small number of people just because I am happy to just hermit in my own little world and do my own little thing. So really I have done all of the things that they say you shouldn't do in business school to run a successful business. And I've managed to run a successful business anyway. So, 
um, like I, I don't have, I don't know anybody. I don't have any connections. So, but I've, I've built a successful coaching business anyway. So I just think like, man, what could I have been doing if I'd been meeting people and networking and making connections all along? So I am actually trying that now um, because I'm trying to branch out my business a little bit um, and kind of work more in a media type space, which really revolves almost entirely around interpersonal connections and networking. And so I'm trying to meet more people and get myself out there a little bit more. And uh, what I'm finding is people are like, oh, okay, so you're new here. I'm like, no, I've been doing this for for decades. It's just I've been doing it in my own little cave by myself. <laughs> so, And now, now I'm trying to come out of my shell and change a little bit. So, you know, hi, I'm here. I'm Darren. Um, it's, uh, it's challenging. That's the hardest part for me. Um, just because I've talked about this before uh, all the time where, you know, the, if, if I'm having a conversation with somebody in a gym, that is the time when I sweat the most. It's not when I'm doing cardio or in the middle of some crazy drop set. It's when I'm having a random conversation with some person I don't even know. Um, that's when I like start dripping buckets of sweat off my body because of the, of the anxiety of that interpersonal contact. So, um, why is that? I don't know. Any therapists out there, you can have a field day with me. Let's talk. I'm not even kidding. Like, let's talk, please <laughs> send, send me your number. Um, I, I need the help. I'm trying, but meeting people is hard. Um, but I, that is one thing that I would change. I would meet more people from early on, make those connections, establish those connections. And then when I'm ready to rely on those and call in something for like something business related, I'm comfortable with that. And it doesn't look like I'm just being opportunistic or anything. So, um, I would go to more shows. Um, honestly, I don't, uh, I, I have avoided going to shows for a long time. Um, I used to go to a few a year, um, back when I lived in Oregon, as soon as I moved out to North Carolina and now Tennessee, I rarely go to shows anymore. Um, I go to the Knox classic here in town. I've gone to battle at the river a few years ago cause I had a client in it. It's only 90 minutes away. So I made the drive down there. Um, I don't, I just don't go to a lot of shows. Um, I should, because every time I do, and the, the power in going to shows is that it reminds you why you're doing it. Even if it, it has been a while since you have done one yourself, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. All right. And it's just like it's a very energizing experience um, and it needs to be a, a something that I, I do more often. And I would like to get out and do more shows. There's plenty in the area. It would just be a good thing for me to get out and do and kind of make myself seen. And also, I would love to get an opportunity to do some media work at some of those shows too, just frankly. so. Um, but I've got to get out. I've got to meet people from the last step and just kind of be known. So um, so what else here are we talking about? Um, I would stretch more. <laughs> you know, uh that's one thing, like if I had a time machine and I could tell myself and ensure that the younger version of myself would listen to my older self, like, dude, stretch for five goddamn minutes after every lift. That's it. And no exceptions ever. Like I would be in so much better physical shape right now. Five minutes a day. That's all it would take. That's all it would take. A lot of power in that. A lot of power in that. Always warm up. And the tagline here is to train like you're 50 when you're in your 20s. Because if you do that, you'll feel like you're in your 20s for a lot longer than you have any right to. Um, along with this kind of goes, you know, training intelligently and not always lifting as heavy as you possibly can just to kind of keep the wear and tear on your joints lower. You want the wear and tear on your muscles to be very high, the wear and tear on the rest of your body to be as low as possible. So you want, you want a low mileage skeletal system, but a high mileage muscular system. Um, accept the lifestyle change and sacrifice. I, I fought this for a long time, and it, it kind of correlates with the next one, which I'll reveal here, which is control your binge eating. Um, I would always feel like when I was in prep or in a deficit that it was supposed to be a struggle. It was supposed to suck. It was supposed to be hard. And therefore it was. And therefore, like, I was always kind of like, you know, the only thing dangling out there that kept me going was that cheat meal that was hanging out potentially um, if we saw the right things. And then I would have that and I would undo a lot of my progress and have to retrace a lot of my steps the following week because those, those cheat meals were never controlled. They were always just out of control. Um, and it was because I didn't fully just embrace the fact that like, yeah, dude, this is supposed to be hard. Like be okay with that. Like that's why you're doing it realistically. You know, honestly, like 
thing is, if it, if it was, I'm, I'm going to flip the old adage here. If it was easy, everybody would do it. I'm going to say, if it was easy, you probably wouldn't do it. Like a big reason of why we do this is because it is difficult. Um, and so you just need to embrace that full stop. There's going to be sacrifice involved. Be okay with that. Enjoy it. You're doing something special that most people don't do. No, you're not curing cancer. You're not solving world hunger. You're not negotiating Middle East peace, but you're doing something that's difficult that most people don't do. And it's okay to take some pride in that, take some ownership in that, like I was talking about before. And, you know, again, not make it your personality, but it's a part of you and own it and let it be a part of you and don't fight it. And if you can avoid fighting it, it gets so much easier. It's like you're not trying to swim upstream. You're just laying back, letting the river carry you downstream. So much easier that way. And I've learned that lesson very late, I would say in the last year or so, realistically, um, where now I'm just like, I'm fine just following my plan every day, whether I'm in a growth phase right now, I'm... uh, you know, approaching 12 weeks in on this cut without a real cheat meal or anything like that. Like I'm fine. Like I would love to eat a little bit more, but you know what else I would love? I would love to be shredded as fuck on stage. And so I'm, that's, I'm willing to make the sacrifices to get there. That's fine. And if there comes a point when I'm not, Hey, it's voluntary. I can always quit. I can always stop doing it. I can pull out a prep for the show if I need to. I'm not going to, but I could, you know, nobody's forcing me to do this. And so embrace Every last little bit of it. That's the important thing um, is you don't just accept it, but you embrace it. And you don't just accept the fact that this is going to be difficult, but you say like, I am doing this because it is difficult. I accept the challenge. I accept the gauntlet that this process is throwing down at my feet. I am picking it up and I am owning it and running with it. And lastly, never forget why you started doing this. Everybody has a why. Why are you doing this? And always be able to answer that at the drop of a hat. Make sure it's relevant to you still. And it can change over time. That's fine. But if you can, if you always have that at the ready where you can just like tip of the tongue, you can always remember that. You can repeat it as a mantra. And you're never going to lose sight of what got you into this, this beautiful mess to begin with. <laughs> so um, I think there's a, there's a lot of power and a lot of value in all of these things. So... Um, that concludes episode 250 guys, seriously, like I can't thank y'all enough for sticking with me for this. Um, it's been 250 episodes. It's been eight years doing this. Uh, and here's to eight more going ahead. So thank you all very much. Drop a review, leave a comment on YouTube. Um, shoot me an email, call in to the number, leave a voicemail. 865-518-6569 is the number for that. Leave me some questions, comments, feedback, whatever you got. In the meantime, y'all stay safe, train hard, and I will catch you all next week. Okay, that wraps up another episode, and thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and tag me on Instagram. I am at Darren underscore star. Also, please subscribe to the channel here if you haven't already, and feel free to check out any of those other videos that you see here as well. 5starphysique.com has details on everything that I have to offer, including contest prep coaching, body transformation coaching, workout programs, swag, and a whole lot more. Thanks again for listening, and I will catch you all back here next week.